Hello, welcome to History Tea, a channel where I spill the tea on history. Today's video will be about the history of swimwear. Spoiler alert, it starts with the birthday suit. I'm sure you've worn a modern swimsuit without giving much thought to how they used to look 100 years ago. And you've probably seen the frilly, polka dotty, high-waisted bikinis of the 40s to 60s. But what about the more modest periods of time when women didn't even show so much as their ankles? Of course, like I said earlier, people originally swam or bathed in the nude, although sometimes they would just strip down to their underwear. Some believe that bathing suits originated as early as 1400 BC in ancient Greece. This is due to the fact that there are urns and paintings depicting women wearing clothing similar looking to a modern bikini while playing sports such as weightlifting, discus throwing, running, and dancing. But there is no evidence of women wearing these clothes while swimming or bathing. Flash forward centuries later to the Renaissance era. People didn't swim a whole lot for many reasons at that time. Um, Swimming in the nude questioned their morality, and some people were afraid of the water mostly because they didn't know how to swim, and some people, you know, just didn't have access to a place to swim. Um, keep in mind that back then, swimming pools weren't everywhere, and traveling to a body of water to swim wasn't the easiest or the cheapest, um, so swimming just wasn't as popular as it is now. I want to briefly mention the bathing costume because it's basically like the OG swimsuit. It was clothing worn by men and women in bathhouses. In the 17th to 18th centuries, uh, the typical bathing costume for women was a long gown paired with a jacket and a hat made of fabrics like canvas, flannel, or wool designed to show no shape whatsoever when uh, wet or modesty. And for men, it was some sort of drawers paired with a waistcoat made of the same or similar fabric. At this time though, any recreational swimming that was done in lakes, rivers, etc. was done typically in the nude or in their underwear, uh, by men at least, I'm not sure about the women. As far as I've been able to find in my research, the first swimsuit popped up in the Victorian era, I think. So um, that was when swimming really became a big recreational activity, but it's kind of unclear? I don't know. I've seen a lot of different things saying different things. But I'm just gonna say the Victorian era, if that's wrong, I'm sorry. But Google, I don't know. <laughs> in 1860, male nude swimming was banned in the UK, causing men to put on some frickin' pants. They were now forced to wear drawers while participating in recreational swimming as well as bathing. Then at some other point in that decade, the women's bathing suits started to really garner popularity. Uh, it didn't look like today's bathing suit by any means. Um, this was because the Victorian era is a very modest time for women's fashion. It kind of like set us back a little bit actually. But it, they basically wore a tunic like knee length blouse over ankle length bloomers. It seems like a fun thing to swim in if you ask me. Then a decade later in the 1870s, uh, a generic male swimsuit came into fashion. It's basically just red and white striped drawers. And by the way, when I say drawers, I don't mean like a drawer. I'm talking about clothes. I feel like it's a given, but I thought I'd just clarify anyway. France has always been big in the swimwear industry, and that's actually where a lot of swimwear innovations have come from over time. In the second half of the 19th century, women's swimming costumes uh, started to shrink. The tops went to the hip instead of the knee, and the shoulder, the arms started, to, the sleeves started to disappear on French swimsuits. And the bloomers started to go to the knees instead of the ankles, and they also became a little bit more form fitting. While some other women in other places still went the wool route with their swimming costumes on the beach, although I think that was just because um, the wool was warmer in cold water. While the French were showing more skin, over in the West, women were still wearing gowns for swimming. The gowns were usually made of flannel and had long sleeves and fell to the ankle with the help of weights sewn into the hems to keep them down while submerged in water. The women were probably being weighed down in the water thinking, gee, if only there was something we could wear on our legs that concealed our bodies and didn't try to drown us. Like, I don't know, maybe pants? That'd be nice. Uh, 
wealthy Western women were basically being drowned by their swimming costumes, the men were swimming in wool because, you know, why not try to make everyone a little uncomfortable while swimming? Quality. The, they typically wore a long sleeve garment that was compared to long underwear. Sounds real cute. Both of these swimming costumes were a product of the extreme modesty of the Victorian era. Another result of the extreme modesty was something called a bathing machine, which is not a machine, not even in the slightest. That confused me as well. It was a, what I'd describe as a cart or wagon-like structure that was rolled into the ocean to create a sense of privacy for women, but I'm assuming men as well. Basically, a woman would get into the bathing machine on the beach and she would be rolled out into the ocean, not too far into the ocean, but in the ocean um, by a horse. And then she would change into her swimming costume and then exit out the back door directly into the ocean and swim and play and do whatever she wanted for however long. And then get back into the bathing machine where she would change back into her regular clothes and was led rolled back onto the beach by a horse again and then she would exit and go about the rest of her day. The bathing machine was a necessity at this time because there was no other option for like a changing room on the beach and women were not really to be seen in their swimming costumes even though it covered everything you know but whatever. By 1907, swimming was a very normal activity and was part of competitions such as the Olympics. But not for women, of course. And the swimming costume was part of beauty contests. It was in that same year that an Australian swimmer named Annette Kellerman would become a swimwear icon after being arrested on a beach for indecent exposure. Her swimsuit showed off her legs, arms, and neck, which of course posed the question, <gasps> women have bodies? Her swimsuit was similar to a male swimsuit at the time. <laughs> to appease the literal swimsuit police, Annette lengthened the legs, sleeves, and added a collar to her suit. Think of like a version of a modern wetsuit. Uh, of course, this still showed off her figure, so at least she won a little bit. <laughs> Annette started to market this new suit to women, and by golly, they ate it up, probably because it wasn't actively trying to drown them. She called the suit the Annette Kellerman, a very creative name that I'm sure took her weeks, even months to come up with. <laughs> Moving into the 1910s, the Annette Kellerman started to become more and more accepted as the norm. Sleeves, legs, and necklines started to shrink. The legs were now falling around mid-thigh, and the necklines were falling now to the top of the chest. Um, the suit even appeared on women from nine different countries at the 1912 Olympics. This was a great time for women on the swimsuit front, not only because we could show more skin now, but because more comfortable fabrics were starting to be introduced. The name swimsuit didn't come into play until 1915 when Janssen Knitting Mills coined it. Originally the company made sweaters, but Janssen was so inspired by the Annette Kellerman and the other more revealing swimsuits of the time that he decided to make his own. He produced a two-piece suit that consisted of shorts and a short sleeve top that fit so close together that it didn't show any midriff. Moving into the 1920s, tanning became more of a common occurrence, therefore more skin was showing. Of course, now swimsuits were made out of more comfortable fabrics than before, but they still hadn't fully figured it out. Now rayon was used for a close fit and silk and jersey were also sometimes used. Manufacturers also started making swimsuits with more decorations, I'm assuming because there was less shame surrounding being seen in a swimsuit, so hey, might as well make it pretty if people are actually gonna see them now. Speedo, not the Speedo, the company Speedo, made a splash in 1928 when they released their racerback suit that further accentuated the body shape. In the 1930s, men started going shirtless, wearing only the bottom half of their swimsuits. Again, we saw more shrinkage as the suits became tighter and exposed more skin. The sleeves disappeared and they finally started using nylon and latex to make the suits. And because of the exposed skin, tanning became even more normal. And the 1930s also saw the first bit of midriff being exposed by a daring few. Swimming had become so popular at this point that in a 1934 study, out of a list of 94 recreational activities, swimming came second only to going to the movies. 
World War II changed a lot about the world and how we did things here in the U.S. One of those things was, surprisingly, swimwear. Due to wartime fabric regulations, the swimsuits got smaller. Uh, the 40s is when we started to see a bare midriff become more of a socially acceptable fashion, as long as your navel was covered. I'm not clear as to why the navel was targeted, but it's important to note that if your belly button was hanging out, it was a no-no. Because swimsuits were showing off the figure in such a flattering way, they weaseled their way into the public eye. Uh, swimsuit glamour photography became a big thing and has led to things that we have today like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. They also became an integral part of beauty contests, which is actually now being taken out. The Miss America pageant removed their swimsuit portion of the competition just last year. On July 5th, 1946, the bikini was born. It was designed by Louis Reard and modeled by Micheline Bernardini. It was named after an island that was home to an atomic bomb test site, the Bikini Atoll. Supposedly, this was because Reard knew that the bikini was going to explode onto the scene, which, I mean, I guess he was right. Um, he was also French, which again shows how the French have always been at the forefront of swimwear. Two-piece and one-piece bathing suits were doing well in the 1950s, while the bikini was struggling. It was seen as indecent and even became banned from the Miss World contest in 1951 after Miss Sweden was crowned wearing a bikini. The 60s saw the introduction of nylon and lycra, and the swimsuit patterns were as bold as ever. And in 1960, Brian Hyland released his hit song, Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini. Elastane, which is basically the same as spandex and lycra, was introduced by Speedo in the 1970s, improving the durability of their suits. Another thing introduced to swimwear in the 70s was the skin suit. It was a small, thin, skin-tight suit that basically became transparent when wet. Uh, it wasn't given the warmest of welcomes, but was adopted by many after helping male East German swimmers win at the 1972 Olympics and female East German swimmers win at the 1973 World Aquatics Championships. As we all know, the 80s was the time of neon and animal print, and it wasn't any different when it came to the swimwear of the time. The swimsuit bottoms for women in this decade also became more high cut, making them into a sort of V shape. The 80s saw a fascination with the sportswear or athletic style. Um, we've all seen either Jane Fonda's workout tapes or Olivia Newton-John's video for physical or even Glow on Netflix. Actually, pretty much anything said in the 80s will eventually show a woman in full aerobics get up. But this style carried over to swimwear as well, with people wearing athletic swimsuits for just normal days at the pool or the beach. The 1990s saw a sort of glimmer of modesty make a comeback in the tankini. The tankini was a basically just a normal bikini bottom paired with a camisole-like swim top that covered the midriff. Um, bikini shopping has always been a sort of stressful thing for women, or it's been known to be a stressful thing for women, because we there's a certain societal body type standard and we all feel pressured to conform to that and have that bikini body or beach body whatever you want to call it but the tankini allowed us to have the freedom of a two-piece and be able to you know like go to the bathroom without having to peel a wet bathing suit off of our bodies um <laughs> while still being able to like cover up a little bit and not be so worried about our body shape or size. Skin cancer awareness was also another reason for the popularity of the tankini. The bikini sales saw an overall decrease in the 90s because of this reason. Up until now, men's swimwear had had a similar progression to women's as far as shrinkage, um, but when the 90s hit, so did board shorts. Like the tankini, board shorts offered more coverage. They were worn lower on the hip than any men's swimwear before them, and they fell to the knee instead of mid-thigh or higher. The early 2000s was an interesting time for fashion. It was ugly. <laughs> I personally remember one of my favorite outfits consisting of pink Crocs back when they were new and cool, and not ironically cool like they are today, but like actually cool and brown gauchos with a little belt and um, one of those t-shirts with either the mean bunny or the monkey on them. I can't remember their names, but if you know, you know. 
uh, basically looks something like that, unfortunately. So you can imagine if that was like cool back then, that the swimwear of the time was also a mistake. It was also a bit of a dumb time for the world. Um, bikinis made a comeback, and I think, honestly, everyone just kind of forgot that we cared about skin cancer. I... To wrap this video up really quick, I just want to mention that swimwear was a very important part of the liberation of women's fashion. Um, and it's also a good example of how everything affects something else in history. It's one of the reasons I love it so much. Like, you can't learn one thing without learning about, like, five other things at least at the same time. And sometimes things that you wouldn't even expect to be connected. Like, if we didn't have trains, swimming may not be as popular as it is today because there wouldn't have been such a quick and easy way to get to a beach for a vacation or whatever. Um, and if it weren't for World War II, uh, two-piece swimsuits may have never been so normalized and we wouldn't have the bikini. So, I'm going that. And that's the tea on history. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something new. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you want to see more and to click the little bell below if you uh, want to be notified when I upload a new video. As always, I'll be linking all of my social medias in the description box below, and I will say that I am most active on my Instagram. If you want to check it out, I do like a song of the week there on my Instagram story um, every Friday, or if I remember. <laughs> Sometimes it's later, and I will post little fun facts or um, share pictures of clothing, uh, historical clothing, um, and yeah, it's just a, it's a fun time. <laughs>